If it's Tuesday, a deal for emergency aid to Israel and Ukraine is in jeopardy, with talks derailed by a domestic crisis at the southern border. My interview with a top senator at the center of the negotiations ahead. Plus, Israeli forces push deeper into southern Gaza in what the IDF is calling its most intense day since the ground offensive started, as UN officials warn of a, quote, hellish scenario for civilians caught in the crossfire. And smaller stage, bigger risk. Four Republican candidates are set to face off in the fourth Republican primary debate, with less than six weeks to go until the first votes are cast and a whole lot of ground to make up on the frontrunner, Donald Trump. Hello and welcome to Meet the Press Now. I'm Ryan Nobles in Washington, where there is a flurry of urgent meetings happening on Capitol Hill as lawmakers spar over billions in emergency aid tied to Israel and Ukraine with negotiations over the border and immigration policy now threatening to derail everything. Here's where we stand. The White House has told Congress they're on a clock, warning that without action, U.S. aid to Ukraine will run out by the end of this year. The Biden administration wants aid to Israel and Ukraine tied together, along with funding for Taiwan and the southern border, in the hopes that linking all four of these security priorities together would push the emergency funding request over the finish line. But the Republican House Speaker Mike Johnson is doubling down with a warning of his own that the House will not take up Ukraine funding without, quote, transformative change to the U.S. border policy. That's like the bill conservative Republicans passed earlier this year, dubbed H.R. 2. It is unconscionable to me that the White House would continue its current policies and not enforce our federal law. We passed H.R. 2 as a top priority to the House Republicans six months ago. When we go home to our town halls, they ask us a very important question. How can we be engaged in securing the border of foreign countries if we can't secure our own? And that is a question the White House has to help us answer. I've told this to the leaders in the Senate. I've told it to the White House, and I'll say it till we're blue in the face. We are committed to that. The battle is for the border. Now, the problem is that this package of conservative policies, which includes funding for a border wall and asylum restrictions, is a poison pill in the Senate. Some Senate Democrats know that, and so do a few Senate Republicans. It's not clear to me that H.R. 2 is necessarily the best way to go about reducing future flows. It is a way. House Republicans didn't get a single Democrat on H.R. 2, and they're asking us to get 20 on our side. OK, well, that, that's not realistic. Now, this comes as weeks of bipartisan Senate negotiations on immigration tied to this funding deal appear to be headed in the wrong direction. Republican Senator John Cornyn told NBC News that Democrats had no choice, no border restrictions, then no money for Ukraine or Israel. I think there's a misunderstanding on the part of uh, Senator Schumer and some of our Democratic friends, this is not a traditional negotiation mm. where we expect her to come up with a bipartisan compromise on the border. This is a price that has to be paid in order to get the supplemental. Why are we sitting down and talking if there's never going to be a compromise? What that Republican senator said, Mr. President, is the textbook definition of hostage taking. In an attempt to break through the political logjam, top Biden officials, including Secretary Blinken and Secretary Austin, were on the Hill today briefing House and Senate lawmakers on the urgent nature of the National Security Supplemental Request. That dire call was going to be punctuated by a personal appeal by Ukrainian President Zelensky, but he wasn't able to make it due to a last-minute matter, according to Senate leadership. Joining me now is Sahil Kapoor. He is on Capitol Hill. So, Sahil, where do things stand right now? We know that some of these senators are emerging from this briefing. Is there the real possibility that Ukraine aid will run dry, or will the pressure of the moment force Democrats into an uncomfortable position? It's a very real possibility that Ukraine aid simply fails, Ryan. That is what the Senate is staring down at the moment. Chuck Schumer, the majority leader, has indicated that tomorrow he'll move to a procedural vote to advance President Biden's entire $106 billion security supplemental. That includes assistance to Israel, to Ukraine, to Taiwan, as well as border funding. 
Uh, Republicans have threatened to filibuster that entire package without sufficient immigration restrictions, specifically on asylum and parole. And this is where the negotiations have not been going well. There's been more progress on the asylum front, according to the sources I'm talking to. Democrats have been willing to move somewhat uh, in the direction of tighter restrictions, even putting, you know, the so-called credible fear standard on the table, raising that, which is, you know, something that many of their own uh, members of their base and immigration activists oppose. Nevertheless, they have been willing to do that. Where things are stuck, I'm told, is the issue of parole. Republicans want major restrictions on the president's ability to grant humanitarian parole uh, in, in you know, cases of refugees. And, of course, this is an issue that's bedeviled Congress and p presidents of both parties for several decades now. It's not happening in a hurry, and the negotiators are, are not making enough progress. So the bill is likely to get filibustered tomorrow, and then uh, there'll be a big question for not only Democrats, but also the Republicans in the Senate uh, to make. Are they going to be able to somehow rekindle these negotiations, or does this entire package fall away? You know, and Sahil, it comes at a time where we see uh, the Biden administration kind of re-engaging on this topic. A number of cabinet-level officials there. Today, we saw the letter uh, from Shalanda Young, or Shalanda Young earlier in the week. Do Democrats on the Hill feel that the White House is engaged enough in these negotiations, or would they be better off without President Biden and his team being a part of them? Yep, some do, some don't, Ryan. There's no clear consensus on whether the White House needs to get involved. There's a brand of lawmaker, as you well know, that prefers to let Congress figure it out themselves uh, when it comes to these things. There are others who say, well, the current uh, situation isn't working. Maybe the president does need to step in. But, you know, appeals to Republicans on the issue of Ukraine aid are not likely to be particularly effective because a number of proponents of Ukraine aid are promising to filibuster this whole thing. They have, they have become wedded to this idea that it has to be tied to border policy. That includes Mitch McConnell, the Senate Minority Leader, a strong proponent of Ukraine and supporter of Ukraine aid. It includes Senator Mitt Romney, the Utah Republican, who's also a strong supporter of Ukraine aid. Uh, they have accepted the general consensus within their party that they won't vote to, to uh, move forward with it unless Democrats make major concessions on the border. And that sound you just played from Cornyn, uh, from the conversation I had with him, that kind of describes this, this theoretical, this imbalance in the negotiations, which is annoying some Democrats. Republicans see, it not, see this not as a give and take. They think their only give is Ukraine aid, and on immigration, they only get to take. Whereas Democrats see this as a give and take on immigration, where they wanted to come up with some a bipartisan compromise of ideas that both parties can support. That fundamental disagreement on what they're even negotiating mm -hmm. has been a big reason that this is stuck. Finally, I will mention Chris Murphy, the lead Democratic negotiator. I asked him what's at stake in all of this if Ukraine fails, and his response, the fate of the world. Mm -hmm. Ryan. Well, we're going to talk to Chris Murphy in just a little bit, uh, and we'll have him expand on that comment to you, Sahil. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, he is, of course, one of the lead negotiators in those bipartisan talks on border policy. Uh, later this hour, Senator Chris Murphy will join me straight ahead. But let's turn now to the situation on the ground in Gaza. As Israel says today was one of the most intense days of fighting yet, and that they've encircled the Gaza Strip's second largest city. The Israeli military says it's pushing deeper into the heart of the southern city of Khan Yunus as, quote, closer quarter face-to-face -face fighting continues in the north. The Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu addressed the offensive in a press conference earlier today. Our troops are expanding their ground operations against Hamas everywhere in the Gaza Strip, including the south of the Strip. And I once again call upon the civilian population in Gaza to leave the combat area, the war zone, with Hamas. And I'm saying from here to our friends in the world who are pressuring us to speedily put an end to this war. The only way to end this war and to end it quickly is to use overwhelming power against Hamas and to completely obliterate it. Now, the U.N. says that hundreds of thousands are under evacuation orders in Gaza, including many facing secondary displacement after fleeing the north. Humanitarian organizations say there's nowhere left to go in Gaza. Aid trickling in is only reaching limited areas in the south, according to the United Nations, which warns that, quote, an even more hellish scenario is about to unfold. Meanwhile, we're learning more about the experiences of the recently freed hostages and what they had to endure. As several of those released by Hamas captivity, along with family members, met with Israeli security cabinet today. The Hostage and Missing Families Forum shared details from the meeting, including one former hostage who told the candidate, cabinet, I should say, quote, I thought I was going to die. I wanted to be shot. 137 hostages remain in Gaza. 
Joining me now from Tel Aviv is NBC's Hala Gorani. Uh, Hala, uh, the fighting on the ground is intensifying. What is the latest uh, on the ground right now militarily, and what's the humani humanitarian situation like in Gaza now? Well, you laid it out quite clearly there, When I'll start with the humanitarian situation because you mentioned about hundreds of thousands of people under evacuation orders in the southern part of the Strip. According to the United Nations, it's between six and 700,000 people under evacuation orders, and about a quarter million of those are doubly displaced. So they have moved already from the north to the south, and as you mentioned, humanitarian organizations are saying there really doesn't seem to be any safe place to go in the Gaza Strip anymore. More. And just for our viewers, six, seven hundred thousand people is about the population of Washington, D.C. So you can imagine how difficult it would be to take that number of people and time and again ask them based on a very um, segmented grid map of the Gaza Strip, ask them time and again to move from one tiny corner of the Gaza Strip to another, especially when there are routine communication blackouts and many people are unable to consult these interactive maps that the IDF is putting out. Now, now, militarily, the Israeli military, as you mentioned, is deep into Khan Yunus uh, with ground troops, but shelling has continued, aerial bombardments have continued. They have also encircled, according to the IDF, the Jabalia refugee camp, which is in the north, and there is very much at that, at, at, in those parts of the Strip, uh, active combat between IDF soldiers and Hamas militants on the ground. There is still, of course, this outstanding question of the tunnels. But what's important important to note is that today, for instance, in Tel Aviv, we had air raid sirens. Hamas, even though it's been eight weeks of intense aerial bombardments and now a ground incursion into the Gaza Strip, are still very much able to launch rockets uh, far from the Gaza border as far as Tel Aviv, uh, which is something we experienced just a few hours ago, Ryan. Now, uh, several of these released hostages, as we pointed out, uh, met today with Israel's security cabinet this afternoon. What, what more do we know about that meeting and what they told the cabinet members? So uh, Benjamin Netanyahu is deeply unpopular. As many of our viewers know now, 80 percent of Israelis and some of the latest polling want him to go. And what is going on now when it comes to the hostages' families is they're putting a, a lot of pressure on the cabinet, saying, look, the priority should be releasing the hostages and our loved ones, and it should not be uh, obliterating Hamas at this stage, that perhaps the priorities as far as these hostages' families are concerned are inverted. One of the hostage family members came even with an hourglass saying to Benjamin Netanyahu, you are running out of time. Mm. Ryan? All right, Hala, thank you so much for that. We appreciate it. Let's bring in now the retired four-star general, Joseph Votel. He was the uh, former commander of the U.S. Special Operations Command and Central Command. He's now a distinguished senior fellow on national security uh, at the Middle East Institute. Uh, general, uh, the Israel Israeli military is now operating on the ground deep into densely populated uh, uh, portions of the Gaza Strip. The IDF uh, is already calling it the toughest day yet. Uh, explain to us a little bit about how difficult urban warfare is, the conditions they're facing, and could it just get more difficult from here on out? Well, thanks. It's, first of all, it's great to be with you. Yeah, certainly, this is, this is the most challenging environment any military force can find itself operating in. The, we've, we've talked for several weeks now about the three-dimensional battlefield, that is, you know, the subterranean on the surface, and, of course, you know, the elevated aspects of of, uh, of urban terrain. Of course, there's a lot of debris, there's obstacle streets, there's uh, improvised explosive devices. Uh, in, in my experience, what, what we often found was that these very dense urban areas can just eat up units, meaning that it consumes them. It, you end up putting a lot of a lot of troops into into small areas uh, because they've got to clear it, they've got to hold it. It's very time intensive. It's very troop intensive. Uh, and then, of course, once you've cleared through this, you have to hold it. So uh, this this couldn't be any more difficult than uh, than any other any other areas that I've that I've certainly that I've ever operated in. That most military forces have. Obviously, there has been a, a tremendous toll uh, of a humanitarian loss of life uh, in the Gaza Strip as a result of this continued conflict. And I, I want to play for you what an IDF spokesperson said about the reports mm -hmm. that two civilians have been killed for every Hamas fighter. Listen to what he had to say. I can confirm the report uh, and I can say that uh, if that is true, 
And I think that our numbers will um, be corroborated. If you compare though that ratio to any other conflict in urban terrain between a military and a terrorist organization using civilians as their human shield and embedded in the civilian population, you will find that that ratio is tremendous, tremendously positive and perhaps unique in the world. Is he right, General? Is, is this, uh, are they actually doing well as it relates to protecting uh, the humanitarian population there if two humanitarian or two civilians, I should say, are killed for every Hamas fighter? Yeah, uh, well, um, you know, they're, they're certainly beginning to do some things that are important to do. The issuance of the grid map, the, the communications, the leaflets, things like that are all things that are very, very helpful in terms of communicating to the civilian population. You know, in terms of the numbers, I, I, I'm not sure I subscribe to, to that, uh, that theory right there. My own experience in, uh, in Mosul and a variety of other places where we operate, particularly in our campaign against ISIS, would not necessarily support that. Uh, and while we while we had civilian casualties that were uh, caused by our enablement of our partners in Iraq or or Syria, they certainly weren't at a weren't at a ratio of two to one for uh, for terrorist fighters. So I, I'm not sure where all that came from. Uh, to me, that would that would not be an acceptable acceptable mm -hmm. situation or a sustainable situation for well, you, for U.S. military forces. To your point about sustainability, uh, and you know they are attempting to try and help civilians out of this situation, but there really aren't too many places for them to go, given how densely populated and how confined this area is. At, at what point does Israel need to, to really take into account that there's really just nowhere for these civilians to flee as this campaign continues? Well, uh, I, you know, I think the point here is that, uh, and this is a lesson that we learned throughout our experience, is that military operations have to be planned in, in accordance with uh, and alongside the humanitarian community, we we had the ability to do that in in Iraq. We and we learned that lesson, and we and I think we did a pretty good job of it. We weren't perfect, but we certainly did better. Um, so it's got to take place early, and it's it's not too late uh, for Israel to to do that, to to reach out, to try to deconflict their operations with humanitarian corridors, with assembly locations, uh, and to and to make sure that the communications to to civilians mm -hmm. are very, very clear, so they can absolutely minimize this yeah. uh, this horrid situation here that is uh, yeah. that's been visited upon them, not only uh, through the military operations, but certainly by by Hamas. Okay. Well, General, thank you so much for being here. We appreciate it. Coming up, we'll, we'll head back to Capitol Hill as leaders from the nation's top universities testify before Congress about confronting the rise of anti-Semitism on college campuses. Plus, impeachment politics. I'm going to talk live to Congressman James Comer. The chair of the House Oversight Committee as House Republicans prepare a vote to formally open an impeachment inquiry into President Biden. Does the evidence support one? That interview is ahead. You're watching Meet the Press now. Welcome back. It has been an extremely busy day on Capitol Hill, to say the least. The presidents of three prestigious universities, Harvard, Penn, and MIT, testified before the House about the surge in anti-Semitism on college campuses nationwide since the start of the Israel-Hamas war. It comes as a new survey by the ADL and Hillel International found that 73% of college students say that they've experienced or witnessed some form of anti-Semitism during this school year. Also on the Hill today, FBI Director Christopher Wray, meanwhile, gave this stark assessment of the threats facing this country during his testimony before the Senate Oversight Committee. What I would say that is unique about the environment that we're in right now in my career is that while there may have been times over the years where individual threats could have been higher here or there than where they might be right now, I've never seen a time where all the threats or so many of the threats are all elevated all at exactly the same time. And in another major development, the Senate Republican Tommy Tuberville of Alabama announced today that he's lifting his hold on all military promotions for three stars and below. Tuberville had been blocking those nominations for months over the Pentagon's abortion policy. My colleague Scott Wong joins me now from the Hill. So, Scott, a crazy day for us up there today. Uh, let's uh, first talk about Tommy Tuberville's decision, which did come as a bit of a surprise. What led to all of this and his decision to finally lift these holds? 
Well, Ryan, I think he saw the writing on the wall, right? Uh, he was increasingly becoming uh, a, a man on an island unto himself. And so, uh, you know, he saw that Senate Republicans, a number of them, were prepared to work hand in hand with uh, Senate Democrats in the majority in order to change the rules to do an end run around him. Uh, and that would have, uh, you know, that would have made his holds a moot point. And so uh, I think Tuberville uh, saw what was happening, decided to try to get out in front of this. Uh, he did concede that this was a, a loss. Uh, let's hear from Tuberville in his own words, Ryan. Do you have any regrets that you didn't achieve exactly what you set out to do, that the policy is still in place? Yeah, I'm, yeah I, it was pretty much a draw. I mean, they didn't get what they wanted, we didn't get what we wanted. And, you know, it's just, when, they, when you change the rules, it's hard to, it's hard to win. And so they changed the NDA, NDA rules. We didn't get to fight for it to leave it in the Senate. And so, just unfortunate, the American people didn't get a voice. And Ryan, the, the opposition within his own party was coming from all corners, from presidential candidates like Nikki Haley to uh, GOP leadership, uh, including Mitch McConnell, uh, as well as some of his uh, House Republican colleagues over on this side of the Capitol. And so uh, he, he was isolated and, uh, you know, backed into a corner, didn't really have any other choice, Ryan. And as a football coach, always looking for football analogies, he, he called the changes uh, to the potential rules like as if football added a fifth down, which I don't know if that's a, exactly the right analogy, but uh, that's how coach speaks. Uh, let's move on now to talk about the FBI director, Christopher Wray. Uh, he called on Congress today to renew Section 702 of the FISA laws. Uh, what was the big takeaway from that hearing? mainly uh, the director coming before the United States Senate and saying, uh, look, you know, really beseeching them, saying it would be devastating for Congress not to uh, reauthorize these uh, key surveillance authorities that he said would allow, uh, you know, that, that do allow for the FBI and other law enforcement to protect Americans. He said that uh, he is seeing increasing threats uh, that they are trying to get out in front of any potential threats uh, that, that are inspired by Hamas, the Hamas attack on Israel. Uh, and he, he pointed to Iran as uh, the biggest uh, sponsor, state sponsor of terrorism in the world, saying that, uh, the, that the FBI and law enforcement have thwarted a number of uh, assassination attempts, kidnapping attempts on American soil uh, in places like New York City even, Ryan. And so uh, really a, a stern warning uh, from the FBI director to, to Congress to get their act together and, and try to pass these reauthorization of this key surveillance law. Okay, Scott Wong, thank you for that report on Capitol Hill. We appreciate it. And coming up next, my one-on-one -on -one interview with Senator Chris Murphy, who just got out of this closed-door classified briefing on Ukraine as foreign aid for Kyiv and Israel hangs in the balance. You're watching Meet the Press now. And welcome back. As we reported at the top of the hour, foreign aid to Ukraine and Israel is on hold as negotiations around border policy stall in the Senate. So far today, senators have not returned to the bargaining table as both sides lob accusations of stonewalling. And just moments ago, the tension spilled over into the all-Senate briefing on Ukraine, with Senator Kramer telling NBC News that a group of Republicans walked out of the briefing after they tried to bring border funding into the discussion. I'm joined now by someone in that room, Democratic Senator uh, from Connecticut, Chris Murphy. He, of course, serves as a member of both the Senate Foreign Relations Committee and the Senate Appropriations Committee uh, and is one of the lead negotiators as it comes to this uh, talk about uh, border policy. So, first, Senator, just give us an idea of exactly what happened uh, in this briefing. Uh, why did a certain group of Republicans walk out? Well, this is a classified briefing, so we're not actually supposed to talk about what happens in classified briefings. Um, I'm not a big fan of political theater. What I saw inside that briefing looked like an exercise in political theater. Uh, listen, here's the problem. 
Um, Ukraine is going to lose this war to Russia. Kyiv will be a Russian city. Putin will have a green light to march on NATO and Europe if we don't support Ukraine and fight Putin at this incredibly important moment. Republicans have decided that they are going to demand that an issue totally unrelated to Ukraine, immigration, gets solved before they save the world from Putin's aggression. Now, I have a lot of personal priorities that I'd like to see solved as well. I could demand that unless Republicans solve the gun violence epidemic in this country, that I'm not going to vote for Ukraine aid. I don't do that. Because I know that the only place that we, the only way we make this place work is by taking one issue at a time. And support for our allies abroad um, is of critical importance right now. So um, until Republicans start being reasonable about their demands on border policy, uh, then um, Ukraine's funding and the security of the world is at risk. All right, well, talk about where the negotiations stand right now. Do you see an opening? Uh, for you to get together with your Republican colleagues and have substantive conversations? Or is the situation, is there just too much tension right now for there to be any progress? Well, I, I still remain hopeful that we'll be able to um, come to an agreement, um, but it has to be a bipartisan agreement. Yesterday, several Republican senators suggested that they're not interested in negotiations, that uh, Democrats need to simply meet their demands or they will cut Ukraine off and they will welcome Vladimir Putin into Europe. Um, that's not how compromise works. I have strong beliefs, but I also understand that I have to sit down at the negotiating table and make a compromise. Republicans right now are not signaling they're interested in a compromise. They're interested in dictating the terms of the border changes to the country. And frankly, the, their terms are not supported by the country. Right now, they're demanding that the entire border be shut down, that we hand the president enormous emergency powers that would be abused by presidents. Um, that's not good for the country. That's not good for the legislative branch. And I'm hopeful that we'll be able to get into an actual uh, rational conversation about compromise. Okay, so tell me where you are willing to compromise then. I understand where you don't want to go, but where are there areas where you think that you could find common ground with Republicans to try and move something across the table? Yeah, I don't negotiate through the, uh, the sort of open channels of the press. We're having a private conversation with Republicans. I've expressed my frustration generally about the fact that they have not brought comp compromise proposals to the table. Um, but what I think we can do is come to an agreement that results in far fewer people crossing the border who have illegitimate claims of asylum than cross now. That should be our goal, not to shut down the entire border to people who have legitimate asylum claims, people that are legitimately fleeing terror and torture. That's the best of the United States, being able to bring people to this country who are being saved from violence. But it is in our interest to reduce the number of people who are crossing who don't have legitimate claims, who are just coming here as economic migrants and don't want to go through the traditional pathways. That's the conversation that we can have if Republicans are open to it. All right, so should Democrats at this point just put something on the table and essentially dare Republicans to vote against it? Well, we're running out of time. I mean, we, we can't let Republicans dictate the schedule of the Senate floor. And so, yes, we are putting a bill on the floor um, that can be the platform for these negotiations. I hope the Republicans vote for it. Um, they, will, they would still reserve their right to vote against the bill later on down the line, but we need to open debate on this national security emergency funding bill so that if we do come to an agreement on this border demand that Republicans have made unnecessarily, uh, then we at least have a bill that's on the floor that we can add an amendment to. We're just running out of time right now, so we need to get moving. So you alluded to this at the top of our interview, but if I could get you to, to kind of go into it a little bit more. Yesterday, the White House warned that resources could run out by the end of the year for Ukraine. I mean, talk to me what you know and can share. I know a lot of what you know is classified about the current situation in uh, Ukraine and the impact on Ukraine if this deal doesn't get done. So I think actually the White House warning was more dire than that. They said Ukraine will run out of funding from the United States. Uh, in fact, the administration is, has no additional money or authority to purchase weapons or systems for Ukraine. Now, what they can do without congressional approval is to continue to give Ukraine U.S. weapons and U.S. weapon systems. 
but we have transferred so much of our own equipment to Ukraine already that we would compromise our own security if we continued that flow. And that's what we absolutely cannot do. I will never support um, transfers of equipment to Ukraine if that compromises my own country's national security. What a NATO general said a few weeks ago is that the barrels of the Ukrainian guns are about to be empty. They are literally not going to have ammunition to shoot at Russian troops um, if we don't get them additional funding by the end of the year. That means for the next winter fighting season, Russia will be able to start winning territory back. And sometime next year, Russia could be in Kyiv. That would be a global disaster. That's the stakes of what we're talking about. And, and are you worried that if the United States doesn't step up with its funding, that other countries that have been supportive could do the same? Well, that will be the consequence. Um, there is no way that Europe can fund this fight on their own, in part because there are certain weapons and certain weapon systems that only the United States possesses. And so if we shut off Ukraine from U.S. funding and U.S. weapons expertise, uh, then Europe will not be able to pick up the balance uh, on their own. They will start to draw back from this fight. And once again, we will see Putin marching into Ukraine and also getting a green light that he can go into a NATO country, that he can go into a country like Moldova and, you know, just keep the fight up for a year and a half. After a year and a half, the West will lose patience and hand that country to Putin. This won't end in Ukraine if this is Ukraine's fate. If you're able to get an agreement on the border, there are some of your Democratic colleagues that are concerned that there should be at least some conditions put on aid maybe to Israel and Ukraine as opposed to just giving them a blank check. Do you agree with that? Do you think that the, the administration should put conditions on that aid? Well, generally, we put conditions on aid that's sent to foreign countries. Um, at the minimum, we should always require that any money we send an ally is being used in accordance with international law and with U.S. law. Um, what I've said is that when it comes to Israel, I'm open to that conversation. Um, I've been very clear that I think Israel needs to defeat Hamas. They need to um, knock out their military capabilities. But I've also been clear, I think, the rate of civilian death inside Gaza has been far too high. So I'm open to providing the same kind of conditionality um, on aid for Israel that we might require other countries not going beyond that. Okay, Senator uh, Chris Murphy, on a very busy day, sir, we appreciate you being here. Thank you. And Thank after you. the break, after the break, the White House is responding to the House Republicans' effort to formalize a vote to launch an impeachment inquiry into President Biden as soon as next week. Congressman James Comer, who chairs that committee leading the impeachment probe, joins me next. You're watching Meet the Press Now. And welcome back. House Republican leadership now says they are targeting next week for a formal vote on launching an impeachment inquiry into President Biden. Republicans now just have a three-seat majority after the expulsion of George Santos, but Speaker Mike Johnson says he believes that they have the votes. Joining me now is Kentucky Republican Congressman James Comer. He, of course, the chairman of the House Oversight and Accountability Committee, and he's been leading the investigation into President Biden and his family. Uh, Congressman, thank you for joining me. Uh, now, why do you need to formally launch this impeachment inquiry now? Uh, and are you opening it because you believe you have evidence at this point that President Biden's committed high crimes or misdemeanors? Or is this more about the process because you can't get your hands on documents or compel your witnesses to appear? Well, we'll say this is about process. Uh, certainly the White House has obstructed us every step of the way. We got a letter from the Biden family attorney, Abby Lowell, implying he wouldn't come uh, for depositions because this wasn't a legitimate impeachment inquiry. It hadn't been certified by a vote. So we're going to bring it up for a vote. But with respect to evidence, I think we've had evidence a long time. Uh, that's very concerning to the American people. Evidence about President Biden's involvement in firing the Ukrainian prosecutor. Evidence about the Bidens taking millions of dollars from China, Uzbekistan, Russia, uh, for things that we really don't know what they did uh, to receive the money. So uh, we have uh, accumulated a lot of evidence. We followed the money. We've been very transparent with the press and the American people about what we found. Now we're in the final stages, and that includes depositions of all the key witnesses. All right, well, let's talk uh, about the evidence that you've collected, and let's try and pinpoint exactly how you believe that that leads 
uh, to articles of impeachment, uh, and we can't possibly address every claim, so we're going to try and focus on one if we can. And, and that is the money that you have uncovered that has come from Hunter Biden, the president's son, and has made it to Joe Biden himself. Now, in each one of these instances, there is a paper trail that demonstrates that these were interest-free loans from the president to his son. So explain to me how an interest-free loan, which one could argue Joe Biden actually lost money on, an example of him being benefited from influence peddling. Well, you say there's evidence proving it's a loan. I've never seen evidence that, that proves it's a loan. Uh, I'm from a banking background. Uh, if, if I loan you $250,000 and then you pay me back $250,000, then I should have a check to you for $250,000. Is that... Am well, I wrong but there on is, that? But there is, sir, uh, you There's have bank not. records. You have There's bank records not. that show that no, the money don't. came from one no, we do account not. into we do the not. other that's account. That's not true. You're mis that's, I, I'm sorry, but that is not true. You're uh, not providing factual information. You're providing talking points from the White House and the Biden legal team. Uh, look, it's very easy to prove a loan. Uh, what they have shown the press uh, is, is not proof of a loan. Remember, we released an email last year from a bank examiner that uh, when they saw that $5 million wire from China into what they called a dormant account of Hunter Biden's, uh, they said it was an investment company with no investments, and they uh, needed to know what that $5 million wire was before they filed a suspicious activity yeah. report. They didn't want to file a report against the son of the vice president of the United States. They said, what is this $5 million? And he said, it's a loan. Right. Remember, that's the theme that they've been saying. They said, okay, well, we need the loan documentation All right, but sir, we're, uh, for the bank exam. So and a, they didn't have it. You're talking about a, a completely separate issue here. Let's get back to this issue of the loan It's payments. all the same. They've been playing it's the loan card, the same, but yet it's they don't It's not all the it. same. And, and, sir, I want to give you the opportunity <laughs> To, to make this case, but we can't go to seven different issues when we're talking about this one specific but you issue. Will provide there were, evidence of the loan. There were two I provided evidence of where sir, he took yes. the money in. You have no evidence. Flash it on the screen. So, Let's so, see. Sir, so sir, there, there were the two checks: the forty thousand dollar check and the two hundred thousand dollar check that came from the president's son and into the president's bank account. There was also subsequent bank records which were provided through the committee that demonstrate that there true. were also that is subsequent not, that is, pieces that of information true. that went that, that came from the president to the president's son. No. So no, that you're saying true. that that information's been made up then. Where did that well, information come from? That came from co well, from the committee. I don't know. We haven't seen that information. That is you committee all, information yeah, that is collected from the bank records that, that your committee has just obtained. show the check. If Joe Biden wrote, sir, his so brother are you telling me that you have a? Do you have a blank? Do you have a a canceled check for every wire transfer that's ever come into well, your? Well, we account? have a with that wire that we. Yes, you, you can personally show. Have I a, can show you that, and yes. that's what has been shown is a. There is bank records that demonstrate You're showing a wire that an exact that same amount of money came. Say, okay. Let's no, move on. They're saying that something from. No, it's not. I mean, look. Are you saying you those say bank records? Okay, sir. Are you saying those bank, bank records do not exist that show the money leaving the there's president's account that shows and going into his son? There's money. But they were money I, sir, laundering. Sir, answer this specific you question. You see wires is going that, all over the. Is there a bank record that demonstrates the exact amount of money that came from the president's account into his son's account that matches the checks that then went back to him? Does that exist? There's yes or no? There's money coming from. No, no. There's money coming from. That a doesn't law exist. Firm. That doesn't exist, sir. It does not exist. It's coming from a law firm. Who who put the money in the law firm? How do you know the money came from Joe Biden? It could have come from one of Hunter's okay. shell companies. You but, have no okay, idea. Okay, so, so you're not. So you are. You are saying that, that evidence. Okay, so you no, are saying look, that that money exists. Look, look, look. That that transfer it does exist. No, They're in the bank no. records that you, you don't know and what your that committee. Transfer is. Okay, you but, don't but know sir, what you that also don't know. You are also suggesting. When you're making the same argument when you say any dime that comes from the president to from the from the uh, the son of the president to the president, you've suggested any dime that comes to him comes from some Chinese company or a Russian company. You do not have specific evidence of where that money has made its way from each stage. Yes, of this. we do. No, you, we have their bank records. It's the same no, you, argument you're you making to wrong. me with Listen, these bank records. The, the American people aren't buying what you're selling. All right, and that's why we have the votes for impeachment inquiry. The, okay. the effort at which the mainstream media is trying to cover this up, it's not hard to prove I'm not trying law. to cover this up, Just sir. show the money. No, I'm show trying, to, I'm trying the... to get you to explain to me 
uh, explain to me where your explanation for this comes from one stage to another. But let's move on to a different topic. Well, and you that don't is, have evidence that it was a loan. That's the, that's the, the final the, word. Uh, regard, even if it were a loan, this isn't evidence of influence peddling in the way that yes, you have described it. Yes, it is, because they would not have been able to pay the loan back were it a loan had they not influence peddled from China and influence okay. peddled that... Uh, but let Florida me, healthcare company. But then, then let's talk about influence peddling and the argument that you're making here. You're saying okay. that Joe Biden, as a representative of the, of the United States government, was able to influence his son's business practices to raise millions of dollars. But all this money that you're talking about being transferred from the president's son to the president while, is while he was not an elected leader of any kind. He wasn't the vice president and he wasn't the president. So explain to me how that rises to the level of an impeachable offense. The money that Joe Biden received came while he was uh, in the private sector between the vice presidency and the presidency. That is correct. The money and the show companies were created while Joe Biden was vice president. So uh, the money that the Bidens, much of the money the Bidens accumulated from the foreign nationals actually happened while Joe Biden was vice president. We didn't know that till this investigation. We assumed it all happened in 2017 and 2018, but uh, it goes back to 2014. So, so that's how we believe Joe Biden has some problems. And look, we honestly where, think that this... In where is the okay, evidence that while he was vice president, he did anything to help facilitate the creation of these companies or help those companies in any way? Well, he met with all the people. He took his son uh, on Air Force Two a dozen times to meet with many of these foreign nationals. He had dinner at Cafe Milano. He had, he had uh, phone do you have, calls. Do you have any evidence that the vice president was involved in any of those conversations with any of those business leaders where they substantively talked about business dealings? Well, I don't know what they talked about. We'll bring the, the president's son and the president's brother in to, to ask him those questions under deposition. That's why we need to bring him in for, for deposition. But look, we have evidence the president lied. He said he never talked to any of these people. Well, lo and behold, we've got pictures, we've got emails, we've got sworn testimony from Devin Archer. He met with all of them. Okay, so my last question for you, sir, is at this stage, do you believe that you have the evidence to file articles of impeachment, and do you think that other members of the Republican Party agree with you? I think that at this stage, we have more than enough evidence to continue with impeachment inquiry. My job as chairman of the Oversight Committee was never to impeach. That's the Judiciary Committee. My job was to follow the money. We followed the money. Uh, the media has changed the goalposts so many times on what we had to find. Uh, you all said for, for months, okay, find evidence where Joe Biden benefited directly from the influence peddling scheme. We have seven transactions now that show that. And you say, oh, well, there's evidence it's a loan. It's not hard to prove a loan. Again, if I loaned you $240,000, I should have a check or wire to you. What they are showing the press is, is a wire from a law firm. Who knows where the money went into the law firm? The law firm could easily dispel this. Oh, okay, we've got a check from Joe Biden. Somewhere Joe Biden should have a check to... Right. But a lot the of Biden's for uh, that amount. A you lot don't of the claim you're making, though, no, you're, but you're, you're, a lot of this is based on innuendo and suggestion. It's not based on hard evidence, sir. And I think that's part uh, of what bank records don't lie. But, bank but, don't but there's lie a bank the record that shows that. the exact amount going from one to the other. Those, but no, it's, it's difficult. No one's seen those bank records. Publish those bank records. That's, I've seen those bank look, records. It, those bank records are available. It's, it's a, it was a committee. Yeah, but it was part of the, your subpoena, sir. You're the one that collected that information. I didn't collect that information. You, you're 100% you're confident. Under oath, you would testify that you know that $240,000 came from Joe Biden. You know that came from Joe Biden's personal account. You're, I know that that's what the bank confident. records say. Are you, would you that testify under oath that you don't believe that it's a loan? No. Would you say it's not no. a loan then, sir? Do you have the evidence that it wasn't a loan? I don't know. I, I don't know whether it was a loan or not. There's no evidence But you're basing this on it. You're calling it an influence peddling scheme and you don't even know definitively whether or not it's a loan? No. You, you don't oh, you don't know definitively. It's like you're financially illiterate. I, I, you look like a smart guy on TV. <laughs> Listen, I'm a, I, I'm a banker, you know, I've been involved in, in, in a bank board for, for a long time. The money that the Bidens paid Joe Biden back with came from influence peddling. When they made the deposits but and sir, then wrote the check the same day, they had like a $2,000 balance. I think one account they were overdrawn in. And they, they deposited the same amount of money 
they wrote to Joe Biden. There's no question. I don't even being, think the, being, the being White House is from disputing that. Being paid back from a loan. I don't think there's any statute that says being paid back from a loan, regardless but you don't of where that know money that comes it's from. A loan. All right, sir. Yes, it does matter. If you take money from a drug dealer, if you loan money to a drug dealer, and that drug dealer pays you back Sir, that's, with money that he sold drugs, then you're complicit but you as a don't, drug dealer. That's, the, that's, where the, that's where the gap, though, is. That's where, and I'm, if, you, if you can fill that gap, that's another thing. But that's, I think, where many of us continue well, to raise that's questions. That's why we have questions. About the, well, you're the, raising, the you're part, attacking me. Of, I'm not attacking you're, you, sir. You, I'm yes, not attacking you. I'm not attacking you. I've been asking Look, you serious you questions know, you about this investigation that many people have had for a long time. And, sir, I'm sorry. We're running out of time. This is, uh, we had a short amount of time to do this. I do appreciate you being on and answering these questions. Obviously, this conversation will continue. I do appreciate you being here. Thanks for being here. And we'll be right back. Thank you. Welcome back, and let's bring in our panel, Tia Mitchell, who's the Washington correspondent for the Atlanta Journal-Constitution, Andy Levin, a former Democratic congressman from Michigan, and Hogan Gidley, the former national press secretary for Trump's re-election campaign and the principal deputy press secretary during the Trump presidency. So, unfortunately, uh, after our interview with the chairman, uh, our time is going to be a little bit reduced, so I'd, I'd like to get your take on it. Uh, Tia, you know, this continues to be a situation where the House Oversight Committee is throwing a lot at the wall. Do you think that they're starting to crystallize exactly what they believe they have as in, it, in terms of an impeachment inquiry? And is it going to be enough to get that vote over the finish line for Republicans? I mean, based on that interview, the answer is no. They aren't really making a clear case for a smoking gun or even the evidence that would convince regular rank-and-file people that Joe Biden deserves to be impeached. And I think they need to listen to Ron DeSantis when he says this could be interpreted as a distraction from the issues that voters really care about going into a, an election year. Mm -hmm. Hogan, uh, you know, you work for former President Trump. He's been done doing impeachment or two. Yeah, and he's, mm -hmm. been, he's done business all over the world. His kids have done business all over the world. Mm -hmm. How is that different than what Joe Biden's done? A lot of scrutiny here. Those people actually did business, and they were giving somebody a deliverable around the world, which is different. T is right about something, though, and that the American people need to be brought along here. You need to persuade them, get public opinion up to move forward on something like this. There are plenty amongst the GOP, the rank and file, the base, that want to see some more movement here. You talked to Comer a little bit about some of the evidence he had, you know, the 20 shell companies, the 200 suspicious activity bank reports, um, the, the shell corporations, money from all these countries. A lot of people don't know that and haven't heard that. I think it's important in the way they've done it so far has been pretty meticulous. They've gone through this piece by piece. So if they're going to vote to do this and move forward, that's fine. But they're going to have to bring a lot of receipts, and they're going to have to persuade the American people this is the right thing. But I know one thing from the Trump impeachment, according to people like Alan Dershowitz and others, you don't have to break any crimes. Uh, violating crime here or, do, or a, commit a, a crime, exercise. it's a political exercise. Yeah. So regardless of what they have or right. don't have, you know, it, it, it remains to be seen on, on how far they can get and, with and, this. And Hogan's talking about the shell companies and the, where they did their business. That was the Biden family. That was Hunter Biden, James Biden, his associates. Right. They haven't found that link yet to President Biden, have they? They found no link to President Biden. And look at their bombshell of this week, Ryan. These payments uh, that they were pointing to, I mean, Representative Comer controls the House Oversight Committee, immense investigatory powers. And they come out with this thing like, here's a smoking gun, these payments to the president, and it's Hunter Biden paying $1,380 back that his dad loaned him to make car payments when he was down and out. I've got a kid right now I'm helping make car payments who's doing very well, but that's what parents do. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is beyond pathetic. Mm -hmm. They are going, they're saying they're going to have an, a, a, a vote on a formal impeachment inquiry where they have produced no real evidence for the American people. All right, we've only got about two minutes left, but let's talk about the debate tomorrow night. Hogan, uh, is there anything that this group can do to break into Donald Trump's lead? Sadly, I think that the News Nation crew is going to fall into the same category that NBC did when I went down there to Miami, and that is you have a primetime event, but the primetime candidate isn't there. It's a real problem because they're trying to create a moment, take that moment, and then make momentum and ultimately a movement. That's tough to do without the person who's in the room who's up by 50, uh, 55, 60 points in some of these polls. So it's going to be difficult, and, and I don't think anyone can break through and accomplish that. Even a, a tweet came out today by a reporter who said DeSantis' people internally are saying, hey, I think this could have been the wrong time. I, I don't think this was right. He, he's, he's down too far. And it, it, does Nikki Haley, who's actually surging, risk getting beat up in this forum and blunt whatever momentum she currently has? 
I mean, you know, as Hogan's saying, she doesn't have momentum in terms of catching up to Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. And to, from my point of view, these are all MAGA Republicans. I mean, Nikki Haley, uh, you know, supports a six-week abortion ban before most people even, a, a woman knows she's even pregnant. So uh, they're not going to break through, I don't think, and they're mm -hmm. not going to do anything to catch up to Donald Trump. Tia, final thoughts. Well, I think it's Nikki Haley who's so shown that she takes advantage of these opportunities. She's used every debate to further her surge. So I think for her, she enjoys it. I don't know if DeSantis is uh, benefiting much from these debates, and he's had a rough week. He needs a strong showing tomorrow. Okay. All right, guys. Thank you. Sorry that we got yes. cut off here a little bit, but an excellent conversation for the short amount of time that we had. Uh, Tia, Hogan, Andy, thank you all for being here. And I'll be back tomorrow with more Meet the Press Now. And then Kristen is also back tomorrow with a Meet the Press post-debate special. She'll have live interviews, analysis, and breaking news. Uh, that starts at 10 p.m. Eastern right here on NBC News Now. The news continues, though, with Hallie Jackson right now. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.